Welcome to the Cycles of Change. I'm your host, David Katzmeyer, with a special edition dedicated to literary achievement. Last Tuesday, a book signing took place in New York. The author was Frank Santersola, former Chief Criminal Investigator for Westchester County District Attorney's Office in the state of New York. The book, The Garbage Murders. The Garbage Murders is a fact-based fiction that tells the tale of an undercover officer who infiltrated a mob-operated sanitation business. This was a ruthless empire that brought death and destruction to anyone who opposed it. But when one officer went undercover to drive a garbage truck and learn its secrets, that empire would fall. What makes a good story? A good theme, a rich plot, story structure, characters we like, a style and tone that grabs our interest? No matter, this book has them all. Comedy and tragedy, conflict and struggle, romance and triangles, faith and betrayal, crisis and conquest. This, as they say, is a book you cannot put down. Perhaps that is why Frank Santosola was recognized by the historic Union League Club. The League was founded in 1863 to preserve the Union. It has enjoyed the fellowship of 15 U.S. presidents, numerous members of Congress, diplomats, CEOs, and individuals who have enriched the American experience. This is where Frank Santasola held his book signing at 37th Street and Park Avenue in New York City, before a monumental turnout of supporters. And this year, the Union League awarded to Frank Santasola the Lincoln Literary Award for Outstanding American Authors. This follows an epic tale that affects us all, even when we don't know it. Former Chief Criminal Investigator Frank Santasola, and he's here to tell us about it with his new book, The Garbage Murders. So Frank, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. Frank, wow. I'd like to ask you a question you've been asked before. Why did you write this book for us? I wanted the, this particular story to live on after I'm gone for my grandkids so they might pick it up and say, hey, this is my grandfather. I know about him. Yeah. I know what he thought, what he felt. That, that's probably the primary reason I wrote that story. Well, Frank, you left us a great legacy because I think everyone who reads that book can understand a bit of what you know and felt because I think as a reader, we experience it with you. That's terrific. Oh, and it's quite a tale. Now, what were some of the greatest obstacles for you to tell this story to us? I mean, you had a, quite an ordeal but you had to bring this to life. You had to bring this into our consciousness. What was it like for you to write this book? Nightmares. Really. I oh. would, would put myself back in the situation, in the moment, yeah. to write. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, then, it, uh, I was sort of surprised. When, when, during, during sleep at night, I, I would have nightmares, reoccurring nightmares about reliving the situation. That w what it was for me yeah. to write the book. Well, I mean, it's like a war zone. It's a PTSD. You put your life on the line. Sometimes it's kill or be killed. We find that out in the book. And yet you went through it. Sometimes they say the only way out of difficulty is through it. Do you feel that was a cathartic experience to tell the story, to be able to work through it and get beyond the ring of fire of how you felt and when you remember all of what happened? Beats going to a psychiatrist. Yeah, you know, it makes... Uh... It made me... F actually, yeah, I, uh, there's a lot of things that you really can't tell a civilian how you feel. When I'm alone in the room writing, uh, I, I can express these feelings to myself and, and I'm able to put them down on paper, and that's cathartic. Well, you know, it's amazing that you can have these feelings. It's a great strength in being able to feel the feeling, because, I mean, the courage that comes through on this, the things that you had to do, uh, and how did you get through it without losing your cool, without blowing your cover, without someone seeing the fear in your eyes? You didn't have it, evidently, because you were against people who are used to reading other people. Their, their, their survival depended on it, their business depended on it and yet they never saw through you. I always felt I had God on my side. Indeed, indeed. I, f I wish I had fear. I don't know, uh, you know. Sometimes, yeah, there were moments when my knees knocked out of fear. 
but for the most part, you know, you can't do this kind of work if you're afraid because they'll see through you, and I've used this expression many times, like glass. Yeah. Was I afraid at moments? Yeah, I was, but um, I had a mission. Um, and I wasn't sort of like thrown into the situation in that I, I had, I've done this, was my career, it, whether it be narcotics or infiltrating a, 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 a mob crew. I love living on the age, edge, David. Mm -hmm. I always have. I've always been a lone wolf. I've always been a rebel. And um, when I set my mind to a mission, um, I'd accomplish it if, at all possible, at all costs. Mm -hmm. I knew the risks, believe me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And because of people like you, we don't face the less, those risks in our everyday life. You know, when we walk down the street and nothing happens, we don't think about it. But something did happen, so nothing would happen. And you do that. So you had to reach within inside yourself and draw from Paris greater and outside of yourself at the same time in order to be in that position and Abs have that covered. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, but I never got up in the morning and, and when I got dressed that I had, I had fear. I, I was sort of uh, excited about what the day was going to bring. Um, there, were, there was, uh, every day was different, you know, in, in this kind of work, in police work. You never know what the day is going to bring, the people you're going to meet. I was probable cause for eavesdropping devices. You, you, I never knew where I was going to end up, where people were going to take me where a c crimes were being committed in my presence. So if it was worth it to the government, then they would write an affidavit for a search warrant or a, a, a eavesdropping device, a bug or wiretap. We had wiretaps throughout the metropolitan New York uh, uh, area um, based on me. So there was an entire teamwork of investigation and police work and surveillance and everything like that. But still, even though you were part of a team, a very well organized team, born of experience, you were the point man. You were out there by yourself. And you had to rely on them, and, and, but in a pinch, you were really on your own, weren't I you? lived by my wits. Um, and I had um, a gift, I guess, that I could see an individual's makeup, yeah. whether he's dangerous, whether he was just a, a bookmaker making money or a, a policy operator, you know, doing his business or who was dangerous. Um, I had that gift. I knew, look, I'm an Italian-American kid, grew up in an Italian-American household. I know what we eat, what we drink, what the, uh, what the conversation is, what to say, what not to say. I was sort of one of them, you know? I ate the same food, you know? We laughed at the same things. I'm talking about wise guys. Yeah. Um, so, it, look, they couldn't pick an Irish kid to do what I did. No. He doesn't, he didn't have the background, he didn't have the, uh, you know, the, um, the sociology, the, yeah. the cult cultural background. They could identify with you. Oh, yeah. And they identified with me because I had ha half, half a brain and I can make money for these guys. Because that's all they're about, is, is making money. Yeah. And they don't care sometimes what they have to do to do it. You know what? I found out one very interesting thing about these people. Mm -hmm. Money blinds them, blinds them. So and once the greed kicks in? Oh, yeah, yeah, you know? They'll like maybe look past Cheech from Orchard Beach. Yeah. That's what my street name was. They named me. So you got the nickname. Cheech? Which means you're inside crew. Though. Well, inside crew, it means uh, everybody has a nickname. Okay. It, it took me about eight months to, to infiltrate the p particular yes. uh, crew I was working. Would you tell our listeners a little bit what a wise guy is? How does somebody in the mob become a wise guy? What does that mean? What does it mean? Yeah. Does that mean that they've been in there, they become an earner for Well, a while? listen, some, some, some people are born into it because their father 
was a, a, a made guy in, in organized crime. Uh, some guys, um, they grew up in a neighborhood where wise guys had the respect. They had the cars, they had the women, they had, they had the money. Um, and these individuals were attracted to that lifestyle. Um, yeah. So they pursued it. But, like I said before, there's certain people that can hurt people and there's certain people that can't. It's the people that, because you have to really make your bones. What I mean by that is take a life to be inducted in, in there's a ritual to be inducted that's in. That's a made man. That's a made man, a soldier. So there's a hierarchy, a rule, there's a structure. It's not anarchic. No, it's, 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 mo it's it was um, modeled after the Roman Empire, the Roman legions. Yeah where you have soldiers and then you have the, the capos and the counselors and the underboss and the boss. So there is an order. There is an order. There is an order, David. Yes. Yes. Did you ever regret what everything that you went through to do this? I regret losing a family. There's a price to pay. Well, yeah, you know, I, I sort of tuck it away, but yeah, yeah, you know. I, I'm getting older. Um, I don't want to be on my deathbed and not say goodbye. A lot of us who enjoy everyday freedom because of the price paid by others, we don't always know what that price is. We don't even know how it affects people. We can understand that a fireman feels the heat when it gets close to the fire. But what if that heat is something that you have to give up in order to do it? You know, but. I wasn't thinking about it then. I didn't think I was going to lose two daughters. I didn't think about it. I hadn't, the, re, the reality of that never entered my mind, ever. You had an objective and you were going to meet it. The only time it entered my mind is the last time I saw my two girls. And they said, uh, Daddy, Mommy says you're just like the mafioso that you put in jail. You're no good. And that was the last conversation I had with them. They had no clue about me. You know what, David? I helped more people that were victims of that life that I could have made cases against. They would have been indicted and convicted, perhaps. I, I, you know what, they were victims to me, whether they were drug addicts selling narcotics yeah. to support their habit. Yeah. I went after the big fish. I went after the people that were in this country receiving kilos of cocaine, yeah. heroin. Those are the people that I targeted. Yeah. That I had the, the opportunity, I, I was out there. I didn't have to report to a, uh, a sergeant or a captain every day. There was street agents that I'd hand a, a recording that I made uh, or a, 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 a report, a police report scribbled on a, a piece of paper. Yeah. So you figured it out as you went oh, out? I figured it, uh, oh, I figured it out. Yeah. I figured out who was evil and who wasn't evil. You know, and mm -hmm. that was the greatest, mm -hmm. the greatest experience and feeling that I had. Good heavens. And what was your job? How did you get in? How did you become part of the gang? <laughs> well, um, the district attorney's office brought me along slowly with uh, undercover investigations and re uh, involving organized crime. Um, they felt, they, the bosses, uh, that I, I could do this kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> they, take, they took me into this, this intelligence uh, office and they had the five families, uh, mafia families in New York. Yeah. The whole back wall was covered with the Bananos, the Genovese's, the Gambinos, the Lucchese's, blah, blah, blah. And he says, pick out a name. Pick out one of these names because this, this name is going to be your street name. Okay. So I picked out Miranda. Frank Miranda, that was my street name. Yeah. Then they targeted a particular organized crime crew working in the area. And the FBI was interested in, 
in a particular crew. The, the office was interested in the crew. They were, they were, um, they were involved in narcotics, the garbage industry, uh, um, uh, gambling, loan sharking. Anything that makes money. Yes. Yeah. Even, 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 even um, uh, white collar crimes. Like if, if you could boost uh, um, stock certificates or things like that, counterfeiting. Anyway, so um, they gave me a new identity. They, they Frank Miranda, social security number, date of birth, uh, an apartment in the neighborhood that I was targeting, and 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 then I it was up to me to get to know a weak link. I found a weak link that that uh, because of money and greed. Uh, befriended me, and that was my entry into the crew. Yeah, the mind doesn't work so well when greed kicks in, does it? <laughs> no. Yeah. And so you found a weakness. But did you have to maintain your cover for a long time before you found that inroad? Yeah, I mean, I, I was look that particular. It was over two years. Yeah. And I I did it for six years. Wow. You know. Good heavens. Yeah. Well, wow. so you wound up, they needed to hire somebody, and you applied for the job. No, th this situ in reference to the garbage murders, yes. um, I had come out of deep, deep, deep cover, yeah. and uh, the owner of this garbage company um, was, was shot mm -hmm. in an attempt to take over his company, yeah. but he lived. He didn't know, and he was involved with it with an organized crime family. He didn't know who to turn to, mm -hmm. so he went into the district attorney's office looking yeah. for help, and that's when I was summoned to a meeting, um, and it was arranged that uh, I would I would drive one of their garbage trucks, uh, and they would they would they would um, uh, have my background, employment records. The, the, the um, drivers of the company were getting assaulted on the road. Yeah. The trucks were being burned. Yeah. Um, so, so it was major intimidation. Yeah, I showed up as, one day as one of the drivers. Yeah. I never drove a garbage truck in my life. 13 tons. I hit everything but a human being. <laughs> there is an amazing interview that you did with Sal Lefrieri, posted on your website, mm -hmm. thegarbagemurders.com. What I want to tell everybody is do this first. Read The Garbage Murders, then go to thegarbagemurders.com and hear the stories of what it was like driving the truck when you did hit everything except a human being. Except the human being. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. I, ha I, I would have to like knock down a half a bottle of, uh, of um, brandy before I'd start the truck yeah. at two o'clock in the morning because I was so nervous. You at least knew how to drive a stick. That, because my dad, yeah. my dad uh, taught me how to drive standard ship, but this was a big 13 ton Mac garbage truck, five speed, si five speed. Yeah. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure I could pull it out of the, the yard. But you learned. You learned. You got it down. I did, well, listen, I had, a, I had a hopper guy that he had no clue it was a cop. Yeah. He, thought I, he thought I was a, I, I was a driver on, that I could drive the garbage truck. His name was Nutsy Faganza from Brooklyn. Yeah. And then I, you know, I figured I had to tell him because the first, we had 60 stops that day. Wow. I wouldn't know how to pick up. We were picking up commercial garbage yeah. uh, containers between from 10 yards to 150 yards. Yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know a container from the back of the garbage truck. Wow. I said, Nutsy, mm. you got to help me here. What do you mean? I said, I never drove a... What do you mean you never <laughs> drove a garbage truck? I said, Nutsy, I need the job. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, he became your spotter? He was the he he ended he ended up guiding me into the containers and then putting the lifting the containers throwing the the refuge into the uh, hopper. Yeah, Nutsy was my hopper guy. And you got through it. Well, 
with, with, with between Nazi and the, and, and the brandy, I got through it. <laughs> I don't want to be redundant here with some of the stories that happened. But when you go to Frank, when you go to the garbagemurders.com, those stories are absolutely hilarious. I don't know how many times I watched those stories. Um, I'm not even going to go into them because you're going to watch them because you're going to see this. I'm telling you some good advice here. <laughs> Read the Garbage Murders. Go to the garbagemurders.com and watch him and Sally Ferrieri talking about what had happened here. You know, um, I don't know if I could have ever done what you did, Frank. I mean, I, th I would be afraid that somebody would see I was afraid, and if somebody sees you're afraid, they know there's a reason. Um, you not only read them, you know how to read yourself and keep yourself in complete control. After the fact, after you went through the, relived the nightmares in order to tell the story so that we may know what it's like, as the years have gone by, how does it feel now when you look back on it? Are you past some of those feelings, or do you relive that feeling every time you think about what you did and what happened? I look over my shoulder quite a bit. Mm -hmm. When I came out of Deep Undercover, I couldn't speak for seven weeks. It's a, it was a psychological thing. Yes. I didn't realize it myself. Um, I always thought I had a myself back here, that once it's over, I could... Um, be me? Nah, I, I, it changes. It changed to me. Uh, to this day, I am, look, I, it's life. I lived that life. Yes. This was a, I, I work with violent people. You know, I thought it would never rub off, but it did. It really did. And, you know, um, I thank God that he stayed with me because um, I could have been in big trouble, mentally, yeah. um, with uh, society. When we look at some of the he, people come back from war. He sort of sheltered me, I think. You know, he has, he has his hand on my shoulder. Yeah. Could have been assassinated a few times. He has his hand on my shoulder. I, I never forget them. I mean, when I wake up in the morning, I thank God. Thank you, Lord. May sound cheesy, but I don't care. I'm me. It doesn't sound cheesy when you consider that there are people that have been through traumatic experiences and could have used being able to receive something from outside of themselves, a little bit of a divine force, recognize that sometimes they've been protected and knowing when they need the protection of getting through, having been through it, and having to get past it. When we look at some of the soldiers that come back, that sometimes may wind up on the street with a bottle in their hand. I, I don't judge anyone that went through that because I haven't been through it. But if more people who have been in such horror, such hell, were able to receive a little bit of divine grace, wouldn't it be able to help them get through it? Absolutely. Help me. It, it continues to help me. I'll tell you a little story. My brother laughs. My brother's law enforcement, but I, I, I had a, you know, I couldn't speak for seven weeks, and I was, I, I, I needed peace, and I was in a, a garden every day, flowers, and till I was able to, you know, find myself, so to speak. Yeah. When I went back to work, one of the secretaries came up to me, and she said, "Frank, can I ask you a question?" Yeah. What does it feel like being a rat? I, it almost stopped my heart. And this is a secretary that works in law enforcement, for law enforcement. I said, <laughs> I may have arrested a lot of Italians, but they're not like me. They're not like my dad and my brother. My brother was with the New York State Organized Crime Task Force. My nephew is with the FBI. They're not like me. I'm not a rat, I'm a cop. Yeah, good answer. I don't know, it makes me, would be tempted to say, I don't know, how does it feel to be safe? What's safe? I could get hit by a bus. Yeah, but I'm sitting here safe because of people like you.
I never, well, thank you. Thank you. David, thank you. A lot of us don't know. The only people who know what it's like are the ones who've been through it. But you're an inspiration to me because anything that I go through in my life, when I'm sitting here talking to you and I know that you could get through what you went through, you could get through the nightmares that you've had, you could get through having your life on the line constantly. And it's because of something, of being able to receive divine grace. It's there all the time. We just have to be able to receive it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great message that you're giving to our listeners. To well, do that look, because if you can do it. The only thing I miss are my girls. Um, but I figure, you know what? Uh, maybe the sins I committed, maybe that's my penalty and I'll and I and I'll that's okay Some that's great okay I've been misjudged Frank and people who do great things are most likely to be misjudged greatly it's only people who never do anything that could ever be misunderstood because they're not doing much to interpret and the greater the task the greater the risk mm -hmm. well we're, we're here we're here for a purpose um, I, I I mentioned it to my friend Sal um, you know, I used to go to church when I was in the life, and I used to pray to God. I said, please, give me something else to do. I need, yeah, get me out of this life. And every time I, no, I'm, this is so true. I left church, every time I, I, I left that prayer, I'd get promoted. <laughs> I'd get promoted. <laughs> I pray to get out of the life, and I get promoted. <laughs> Can you go figure? Well, <laughs> mysterious ways, Frank. Mysterious ways. Yeah, and that's. Uh, yeah, I used to pray. Because, well, you know, Frank. What I want to ask you: You gave a fact-based fiction account in mm -hmm. this book. Mm -hmm. where you can really live through the story, live through the comedy and the tragedy and everything that is there. And there is a lot of comedy in it of all things, who would imagine. Um, but what would you tell people who are living their lives, though that they may not be as adventurous as yours, we all have trials and tribulations in our life. Is there a universal lesson that you've been able to learn as you got through these that you can pass on to everyone mm -hmm. because you've been through it greater than the rest of us. Mm -hmm. So what you experience will apply to us all. Yeah, listen, life is a gift. Don't give up on life. It's a gift. So you have to remember that. Don't give up on life. It's a gift. Amen. Amen. Frank. I want to thank you for writing this because I really couldn't put it down. Thank you. I just couldn't put it down. Thanks. You know, 36 hours ago, I was in Rome. I just flew back. And I woke up one morning just a few days ago. The day before me was to go into downtown Rome, see the Trevi Fountain, the Galleria di Borghese, go to the Sistine Chapel, mm -hmm. go to the Basilica. But when I woke up that morning, we were about to leave, and I had a little time, and I go, I got time for one more chapter. <laughs> I wonder if they got the goods on Shorty Newcomb. <laughs> I took that book, I read another chapter, and boom, I was off for my day. <laughs> now let me tell you, that was not the low point of my, my day, uh, <laughs> reading that chapter. I had to know. <laughs> okay, we're ready, let's go. <laughs> it was amazing. Folks, this is a book you can't put down. Take it from David Kassmeyer, The Cycles of Change. Frank, it's a privilege talking to you. You've given us a lesson that I didn't expect. I thought I was going to find out a little bit about adventure, and I found that the greatest adventure was how you got through that adventure and what you know. You know this like you know people. And folks, if you listen to Frank Santosola, then read his book. You're going to know it too. Frank Santosola of The Garbage Murders and thegarbagemurders.com I thank you for taking the time to share that with us. Hey, I thank you for the opportunity. You know, I, I mean, I, I hope, you know, your viewers um, will understand that, that life's a gift from God. And uh, we're, here, we're here to do um, our, our mission. We, we have a mission. 
we do. But enjoy it though, because uh, you know life is uh, could be a, a, a lot of fun. It can it's, be. It's not all negative. Well, in talking to you, Frank, that lends a little support that I think I'd be able to remember that. Amen, bro. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you David. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for listening. I'm David Kasmar from the Cycles of Change with Frank Santosola. Bye-bye.